Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God, our Father, and our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Have you ever been to a funeral for a loved one? I suspect each of you has. Maybe it was a spouse who passed away. Maybe it was a sibling. Maybe a dear friend or even, unfortunately, a child. In each of those situations, grief and sorrow are naturally present, and they're naturally present in such force that they threaten to overwhelm your ability to understand the situation, to think clearly, to be able to notice many of the normal things you would. The grief weighs so heavy. And the questions come along with the grief. What does one do in the face of the indisputable reality of death? What words can be spoken that provide comfort or hope? You all have probably experienced the well-intentioned but fumbling remarks of those who care about you trying to find those very words, words to help the hurt lessen a little, to fix the problem that death presents. But ultimately, we don't have those words We don't have words on our own that bring hope and joy back into such a situation. God knows that. That is why Jesus came down to earth. He came to give us His words. See, during Lent, we've been focusing on our sinfulness, sorrow over that sin and the reality that it brings, and today we're confronted in our readings with the most visceral and overwhelming reality of sin death, the great leveler, the thing we're all subject to, the thing that makes most of what we spend our time doing seem meaningless. Yet, even that is overcome by Jesus Christ, the Word made flesh. That is what we learn today in our reading. So to give you a little context for the reading, we have Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, and most of you probably know of Mary and Martha from the account in Luke chapter 10, where Jesus shows up and Martha's the busybody that's trying to do all of the proper stranger welcomes and the rituals that go along with that, and Mary decides to sit at the feet of Jesus and listen to what He has to say. And understandably, Martha's frustrated because The proper rituals need to be observed, and all the things need to get done, and Mary is not helping at all. And so she complains to Jesus and says, Jesus, tell Mary to help me out. And Jesus says, Mary has chosen the better portion, and it's not going to be taken from her. Well, in John chapter 11, we meet their brother Lazarus. Now, he's described to Jesus by those who are sent to inform him that he is not well that he's ill, that he is one um, whom Jesus loves. He whom you love, Jesus, is ill. So it's clear that Lazarus, even though he doesn't really appear in any of the texts of Scripture outside of these two chapters, is a dear friend to Jesus. He's ill, and so as you would imagine, if you know a guy named Jesus who can do miraculous things, if somebody you love is ill, what are you going to do? You're going to reach out to Jesus for help. And so that's what they do. And after hearing the news, because the text tells us because Jesus loves Mary and Martha and Lazarus, he sticks around in the area for a couple of days. And there's two reasons why he does that. One is, it explicitly says, because he loves them, right? And we'll see what that plays out as soon. But also earlier when, there, when he's informed of Lazarus' illness, he says, The illness does not lead to death. It is for the glory of God so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. So if you recall from our reading last week of the blind man who is healed, again we see this, this expression from Jesus that the reason that this malady of sin is present is so that God's mighty work can be revealed. So that glory can be given to God and now here to the Son, to Jesus. But there's another important note to the context of the story. 
is that Jesus is now in a dangerous situation. Now, it doesn't seem like it when we just take this short section of verses, but just prior to this, at one of the the high feasts, Jesus equates himself with the Father, and the reaction by the Jews, many of the Jews who are then again mentioned here in this text, is that they wish to stone Jesus, And then he questions them further about what he said that they wish to stone him, and then it says at the end of that text, they seek to arrest him, but he is able to escape. So Jesus has just fled from this place. He hears about Lazarus' illness, and because he loves them, he stays around in the area because he's going to go back. And you can see that he's going back to a place that isn't safe by the reaction his disciples have when he tells them, let's return to Judea. They're worried about his safety. If you look in verse 8 here, he says, the disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just now seeking to stone you, and are you going there again? And then, of course, he tries to explain to them he's going there for Lazarus because he's just sleeping, and the disciples don't really get what's going on. They think he's talking about Lazarus taking a nap. And so they're like, oh, he'll be fine. He'll just wake up. And then he says plainly that Lazarus has died. And then he says, and I'm, for your sake, I'm glad I wasn't there so now that you can bear witness to the glory of God. Now we see this danger again present itself when Jesus does return, because when Martha hears that Jesus is returning to town, she goes out to meet him, because she's afraid that if all the others see him. It's going to bring back the the recent events. Jesus has enemies among the many who are mourning with Mary and Martha. But there's also another detail to take note of here that will show up later, which is that Lazarus has been dead at this point for four days. And that's specifically mentioned because the typical rabbinic understanding of the day is that the spirit would linger around the body for three days after death until the color of death would show in the face and then the spirit would leave. And so there's a sense for three days that the spirit could return to the body. So four days means you are completely dead. Not mostly dead, but completely dead. So it's making it clear that if Lazarus rises from the dead, it is God, it is the Son of God who does this. For he's at this point the only one who can. So Martha meets with Jesus and she says, If you were here, my brother wouldn't have died. And even now, if you ask God of anything, he will give it to you. Which is interesting because it seems like she's making a confession of faith about Jesus as the Messiah, but not quite. She still is viewing Jesus as a holy prophet, a holy teacher whose prayers hold extra weight with God. She still hasn't quite identified with Jesus as God incarnate. And so his response to her is sort of the key to this whole text, because as you may have figured out, we are the grieving people in the text. We are Mary and Martha. And he says this to her after she says, that if you pray whatever God you ask from God, God will give you. And Jesus says, your brother will rise again. And then Martha says to him, thinking that he's just trying to find consoling words for her in her grief, I know that he will rise again on the resurrection on the last day. But then Jesus says, no, 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 that's, that's not what I'm talking about. He says to her, I am the resurrection and the life Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. And then he very pointedly just asks her, Do you believe this? And she says to him, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is coming into the world. Which again seems like a great confession, fully faithful to to the identity and work of Jesus but not quite yet, as we'll see later on when it gets to the actual moment where Jesus is going to raise her brother, she still doesn't fully understand what he's doing. But after this exchange, she goes back to get Mary, Mary who is weeping and is being consoled by many of the Jews, 
And as soon as she hears Jesus around, she goes immediately to see him. And all those who are around her notice her quick departure, and they follow her, thinking that she's gone to the tomb. Um, and they're supposed to mourn with her. That's what, the way this would work. But then she comes to Jesus, and she says pretty much the exact same thing as Martha at the beginning. If you had been here, my brother would not have died. But here's the really cool part. When Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who had come with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in his spirit and greatly troubled. Here's where we begin to see the first inkling of the way that God and his love feels about death. It troubles him. It moves him in his spirit. So he says, where have you laid him? And they lead him to the tomb. And notice that when Jesus is troubled and moved in his spirit and he speaks to them, he's no longer speaking just to Mary, but all those who are gathered in mourning. For it says that they respond to his question, Lord, come and see. And then, of course, you have the, the favored verse of all the uh, junior high kids when you ask them to memorize the verse in the Bible. They always pick John 11, verse 35, Jesus wept. But even though that's a small verse and certainly easy to memorize, it's an extremely important one because it communicates to us that our God is not a stranger to our suffering, that He joins us in our grief, that He loves you, and that means He really does. So the Jews said, see how He loved Him. They see Him weeping. Which is, of course, part of his weeping, but it's not the full reason for why he is weeping. He's weeping because he's troubled by the reality of death. You are intended to be immortal, to live a life of fellowship and perfection with God. Death was not part of his plan, and so it makes sense that death brings sorrow to Jesus. So he's going to do something about it. Then Jesus, who's deeply moved again, came to the tomb. It was a cave and a stone lay against it, and Jesus says, take away the stone. But here again, Martha protests because he's been dead for four days. It's going to stink. You see, Martha still doesn't fully understand what Jesus meant when he said, I am the resurrection and the life. He wasn't talking about some date in the future. He's talking about right now. And he tells her, did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they take away the stone, and Jesus lifts up his eyes and says, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this on account of the people standing around, that they might believe that you have sent me. So again, this theme of Jesus' work glorifying God and now glorifying the Son. That He's doing this for the benefit of those gathered around so that they may witness the glory of God. When He had said these things, He cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The man who had died came out. Such a little part of that sentence. But can you imagine being in the presence of Jesus, and seeing this occur, the man who had died, he's been dead four days, by all rights should be stinking, the man who died came out, his hands and feet bound with linen straps and his face wrapped with a cloth, and Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. Dear friends in Christ, the peace of God has been absent from the world since the fall into sin in the Garden of Eden. It was no longer possible for you and I to have a right relationship with God. We were justly condemned, deserving of the wrath of a just God. Until now. This is what Jesus has come to restore, a peace that passes our understanding a peace that invades spaces like death where there should be no joy and no hope and brings it to life. 
That's why he's here. This is our peace. A peace that is restored only by Jesus. We have no words to give, but he has victorious words. Words that overawe even death. And that peace is restored. The mourning of those who love Lazarus is turned into joy. He's alive again. Well, let's go back to the funeral. Close your eyes. Think of a funeral you've been to. The way you felt. The sorrow. The loss. The hurt. In that moment, everything is leveled. All the things we thought were really important washed away, swallowed up in the reality of death. And in that moment, it seems a reality that can't be defeated. But dear friends in Christ, then Jesus sees your weeping and is deeply moved in his spirit and greatly troubled. As great as what we just heard about with Lazarus, that was just a preview of the work that is to come. The main work is about to begin as we near Holy Week, the great act of love of all time from a God who loves his people, who's deeply troubled by their distress and their sorrow. For Jesus has come to conquer sin in all its forms, including death. And he says to each of you, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? He says to us. And by the grace of God and Jesus and the giving of the Holy Spirit through his word, we do. In our baptism, he called us his own. He washed us clean through water and the word. We died to sin with Jesus and rose victorious over death to a new life that has no end, to a new life untroubled by the sorrow of death. And so now, until Jesus returns, it is the job of the church to bring Jesus into situations which we cannot deal with, most importantly, the situation of death. I don't have the words. You don't have the words, but Jesus does. He is the resurrection and the life. Our faith in Him gives us life eternal, which conquers even death. That peace which passes our understanding restored, restored for all time. So for those who believe this, that Jesus is the resurrection and the life, not even death can disrupt the peace that we have in the victory of our Lord Jesus Christ. May this peace carry you into Holy Week this year as we meditate and remember on the great act of love our God carried out on our behalf so that in him everything is made new forever. In the name of Jesus, amen.